Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jane Huckabee, and I'm the director of the International Human Rights Clinic at Duke Law. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the final event in our COVID-19 Advancing Rights and Justice During a Pandemic. The series has been co-convened by four organizations from Columbia Law School, uh, the Columbia Law School Human Rights Institute and the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law, the Duke International Human Rights Clinic and Just Security. The series was really convened to provide a space to talk about the numerous human rights impacts associated with COVID-19 and to also provide a chance for dialogue on thinking through what a human rights compliant response would look like in the current context. We've had throughout the series 15 events, we've had over 20 co-sponsors and an extraordinary array of speakers addressing diverse topics. We've reached thousands of people globally and many of whom have engaged actively with the series uh, through Twitter and, and through other modalities. Um, all recordings of the events in this series are available through the website for the series, which is www.tinyurl forward slash COVID-19 Justice Series. While today's event does bring to a close the spring version of our series, we will be taking suggestions for future events from students, from scholars, from practitioners, and consider resuming uh, in the fall with the beginning of our academic year in September. Um, so with that all said, I am very happy to be handing over now to my colleague, Larry Helfer at Duke Law to moderate today's event. Thank you very much. And thank you, Larry. Thank you, Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this last event of the series on a very important topic. I'm Larry Helfer. As uh, Professor Huckabee said, I am a professor at Duke Law. I co-direct the Center for International and Comparative Law here. And uh, among my areas of research and advocacy over the last uh, two to three decades has included the rights of uh, LGBTI persons and so I'm uh, really delighted and honored, it's a privilege to, uh, to moderate uh, this panel today. The topic, uh, as previously advertised, is uh, COVID-19 and the human rights of LGBTI people. And this is obviously uh, a, a tremendously important topic, um, largely because the challenges of the pandemic that we all face are especially acute for these communities whose human rights were already uh, under threat or violated in many different parts of the world, including from state-sponsored and private violence to criminalization, to arbitrary arrest and detention and discrimination, just to name a few of the relevant issues. And I'm really truly delighted to have uh, a interesting and diverse group of speakers to share their perspectives on this broad topic with you today. I will uh, introduce them briefly in a moment. Uh, the format for our discussion will be that each panelist will speak for seven minutes. And after we have uh, concluded with the presentations, there will be a question and answer period. Uh, and I encourage all of you to submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A function or on Twitter at hashtag COVID-19 justice, or one word, COVID-19 justice. So let me uh, turn to introducing our panelists in the order of their presentation. First, uh, Victor Madrigal Borlos is the UN independent expert on the protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Next, Gloria, Carriaga, who's professor at UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Our third panelist is Danilo da Silva, who is the executive director of Lambda Mozambique. And our fourth panelist is Yamania Brown of the Pacific Human Rights Initiative and co-secretary general of the International Lesbian and Gay Association World. So without further ado, let me turn things over to Victor Madrigal Bobos for uh, his comments. And again, I encourage all of you, if you have questions, to uh, send them via the Zoom Q&A or on Twitter. 
Victor, over to you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And uh, allow me to thank uh, uh, Duke, Columbia, Harvard for uh, putting together this uh, panel. Uh, I'm also greatly honored to be sitting amongst uh, what I consider to be great giants uh, of the movement. Gloria, Imania, Danilo are all uh, powerhouses in their own right, uh, whose work I greatly admire. So it's a great honor for me to be sitting among them today. You mentioned, Lawrence, the issue of a human rights uh, approach uh, that could be applicable to answering to the pandemic. And that gives me a very good leeway to describe a little bit the work that we've been trying to do from the mandate in relation to this issue. Uh, when the pandemic started, it became very obvious to me that this was a phenomenon that we would not have uh, completely uh, experienced in uh, our uh, lifetimes, even though, of course, we do have strong guidance from the management of situations of emergency and states of exception about what are the legal limits that guide uh, measures taken to protect public health. Uh, that framework, the strong framework of necessity and legitimate objective and proportionality is, of course, the point of departure that we took, but we knew that this was going to be entirely different, both of in its global uh, uh, scope and also the fact that it actually affects a great part of the population of this planet. And so the mandate got itself into an active listening position while at the same time very actively working with my colleagues, the system of special rapporteurs and independent experts of the United Nations. And very quickly, I'll try to provide you with an overview of the result of those two streams of work. On the one hand, the work of special procedures has provided guidance to states in relation to what we understand as a human rights-based approach for the response to the pandemic. And that has four elements. It needs to be a response that is non-discriminatory, meaning that both in its intent, but also in its impact, there needs to be diligent assessment as to whether persons are going to be either targeted or disproportionately affected by the measures. It needs to be participative. It needs to ensure that the persons from affected populations, communities, and groups are going to be part of the design of the measures, not only because of questions of democratic governance, but most importantly, because we know that measures need to cater for the way that communities uh, configure their dynamics and their day-to-day -day routines, otherwise they will not work. Third, they need to be empowered. All of the energy of empowerment of civil society needs to be used in relation to the response of the pandemic. And fourthly and finally, it needs to be, they need to be measures that, are, that have accountability. That is to say that there needs to be a system that allows us to evaluate whether the measures are really designed or having the impact of protecting public health uh, or rather other objectives, which is um, what we know from our experience as human rights practitioners that is often the case in states of exception. That's the thread of work of special procedures, generally working on the provision of states, uh, advice to states in relation to a human rights-based approach. Now let me turn, turn to what the mandate has been doing. As I said, I placed the mandate in a very active listening position and I have participated over the last 10 weeks in probably over 20 uh, multitudinary meetings. I have myself held three town hall meetings with participation with over 500 individuals coming from uh, over 80 countries. Um, uh, the persons that are on this panel have participated in one way or another in providing input in many of those events. And what is it that we have learned? We've learned, I would say, um, gr three great lines of findings. The first one is we know that this pandemic affects a great majority of the world population in some way or another. But we also know that LGBT persons come to suffer its impact from a situation of weakness because of systemic violence and particular exclusion from 
sectors of employment, health, housing, and, and, uh, and uh, education, uh, to, to name only a few. Um, how do you stay at home, which is one of the great measures uh, to fight the pandemic, when you are in a situation of homelessness? How do you wash your hands constantly if you are among the two billion people that my colleague, the Special Rapporteur on Access to Water and Sanitation, steams that uh, don't have access to water. And we all know that LGBT populations, because of disproportionate uh, and, and exclusion, are disproportionately represented in the ranks of the poor, the homeless, and in general, the persons having worth health outcomes. Second, I would um, convey to you that I am very concerned about the fact that I believe some states are using the pandemic as an excuse to attack uh, LGBT persons or to withdraw rights that had been acquired by them. I am dismayed today to find out that Hungary has passed Article 33, infamous disposition that is actually withdrawing the possibility of legal recognition of gender identity to trans persons within legislation aimed at COVID-19, at response to COVID-19, I have already expressed to Hungary, I see no reason why this would have any sort of logical connection with a pandemic in the context of which, if anything we have learned is that trans people need legal recognition in order to have full access to the rights. So that's one example. We just saw, of course, uh, others, uh, measures that have been taken under the ages, and this is why I think the element of accountability is so important. And finally, we know that civil society has been working actively and uh, incessantly to actually cover the voids left by states, from putting together food packages and hygienic uh, packages to distribute to the population, to actually, at the global level, provide overviews and coordination such as the one that is done by ILGA, the network to which uh, Imania is a secretary general, or rapid response funds that have been created. Civil society is a global asset that needs to be recognized and valued. And in the context of LGBT, it's very clearly able to deliver very tangible results. They need to be brought in as part of the response to the pandemic, it's a must. All of this is embodied in a, what I consider to be a historic statement, which was signed by 96 special rapporteurs, independent experts, and regional commissioners from the inter-American and European system, where all of these findings are actually encapsulated, and that constitutes, I believe, a strong statement to the effect that LGBT persons represent a meaningful proportion of people everywhere, and also people affected by the pandemic, and therefore they need to bring in the solutions. Thank you so much, Lawrence. I very much appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, let me turn things over now to uh, uh, Gloria Carriaga. Thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this panel and to join with colleagues and friends that who have been working so hard for so many years. I'm very glad to see them even by this remote situation. Uh, I wanted to, to have a, a panoramic perspective about what's happening in Latin America because at this stage of the COVID-19, Latin America has shown big contrasts, contrasts. It has become the world epicenter of the new coronavirus pandemic and the main culprits are Brazil, Peru, and Mexico, which are among the 20 countries with the highest number of accumulated infections and deaths and with rapidly growing numbers. Fortunately, the reality of the continent is very heterogeneous and the problems of these countries are not frequent in most Latin American nations. Particularly, I want to mention 
the streaking is the response that the populist governments of Mexico and Brazil had sought to minimize the epidemic and seek that their followers continue to support them regardless of their own health or that of others, maintaining contact with people and continuing with their visits all over the countries. At the same time, we have got examples where Costa Rica and Uruguay have managed to control the coronavirus virus and prevent the spread of the pandemic with the lowest incidence and mortality rates, and so far with the lowest death rates, where governments enacted the national health emergency promptly. Public shows were banned with the exhortation to stay home and perform activities remotely long before the epidemic became a problem. In this framework, the situation of LGBT people is extremely problematic in countries such as Brazil and Mexico, where the government has not only avoided attending to their needs, but the steps have been taken in the context of rights. While in Uruguay and Costa Rica, the development of public policies continues and Costa Rica prepares to, to install equal marriage in the coming days. In an environment of high discrimination, the conditions to face the COVID-19 pandemic necessarily become very problematic for LGBT. Their da daily survival has been char characterized by the development of escape and refugee strategies to build safe spaces. The pandemic now leaves us in serious vulnerability, having to return to a family environment where we have not been accepted and where resources for development are in constant dispute. According to many different diagnoses on homophobia, it is the family spaces and family members who express different forms of violence that significantly affect our dignity from silencing, discrediting, pointing out and sanctioning our ways of being. But also where the possibilities of fulfilling activities for personal development, whether educational or work, are affected. In this sense, the family space often becomes a place of dispute where we must fight and compete with others for a social place that give us the recognition we need but also for a, for a own space and the resources to comply with our own responsibilities and needs. At the same time, we have to think for with a, we have to think about those who have the resources to live alone today. They do not necessarily have the love of social support they need away from their families and with friends in confinement, this distance of the group, friends or own family that we have built necessarily has serious consequences for the safety and well-being of people who face discrimination. Likewise, the restricted health services available today turn out to be risk areas and, be, and lacking the necessary supplies to continue the treatments. And in many cases, it is necessary to consider the correspondence between the identity and, its of, and their official documentation to guarantee the access to services. In economic term, terms, I want to show up that, that uh, in these countries, access to paid work is not guaranteed for many LGBT, LGBT people much less the possibilities of promotion and career development. In, I mean, the job placements of LGBT people, people, despite the various initiatives developed to guarantee employment for different identities, has not been a sustained achievement. 
For many people, flexible work gave them the opportunity to avoid having to face homophobia in a closed environment, provided them with a good in income and the enjoyment of their time. But in the face of the pandemic, they have been confronted with a condition of deep insecurity, no salary, no social security, and great uncertainty about maintaining or achieving a contract. Others started small and even medium-sized companies that are closing today. Still others in sex work today not only have not a job, but they have even lost their homes as they used to live in small hotels. We have even been affected too by the measures that have been implemented in countries such as Panama, Peru, and Colombia to define going out on the street by sex, which do not take in account the wide diversity of gender, reaffirming bi biological determinism and exposing non-binary people to prosecution and criminalization again. By, by imposing the rule of sex gender-based segregation, we return to the alleged biological determinism of sexual deformities, dimorphisms, placing no binary people in a known place. Once again, subjected to risk and vulnerability as a result of the stigma and violence that trans and transvestite people face in their daily lives. Thus, these measures ignore the fact that it is precisely non-binary people who in many countries have certainly been violated or tortured before the end of the day. In a society with stark tendencies to individualism, the best response has come from the most vulnerable. Trans sex workers have organized themselves to bring food and shelter to their most disadvantaged companions. But most of the help has been limited to remote exchange for support or bringing information of, of where to reach the attendance of some needs. And now we have to start thinking, what are the possibilities for the exit of the confinement? In a, in a not easy panorama, where the organizations of defense of the LGBT rights will be deep weakened, and many people do not have the social security to start again. But in, the, in a moment that the world and our lives have changed, we need to emerge from this global crisis and ensure that we can build a new way of life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gloria. Really do appreciate your, your insights. Let me now turn to uh, Danilo da Silva for his intervention. Danilo. Uh, good evening from Mozambique, Southern Africa. And uh, thank you for the organizers for setting up this, uh, this, uh, this panel um, and bringing up this issue, which is quite relevant um, that we are going through. So uh, I'll start my, uh, my presentations and um, to say that um, uh, the previous speakers have, uh, have touched many of the issues that LGBT people are facing um, in this pandemic. And um, it's not new. I think it's a thing that goes uh, uh, across the world. Um, and, and once again, it proves that when, um, when a crisis emerges, the most, most vulnerable are the ones that, are, that suffer the most. Um, and uh, we, 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 we as LGBTQI people uh, are the ones that um, are having, uh, the, uh, feeling the greatest impact of this, of this uh, pandemic, um, not because we are LGBT people, but because the structural uh, barriers that are out there that prevent us to, to, to um, to, to be part of some of these uh, relief programs that are, are being uh, uh, setting up. Setting up. Um, I'll start my, um, my interventions talking about 
um, yes, many things were said that uh, happened, uh, that are happening to LGBT people uh, around the world. And, and I think that the most uh, difficult one is to be locked up in a homo homophobic household. Um, it's, it, it, this is no joke um, for you to be um, in, a in a household uh, with your parents or with your uh, caregivers that don't uh, recognize you as a human being. It's, it, it's, it's beyond uh, any, uh, any type of torture that any human being can, can, can endure. Um, but in uh, another hand, uh, we have also uh, things that are happening. And uh, as Victor touched, uh, some of the states are using um, uh, the COVID-19 as an excuse to crack down or, 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 or to prosecute LGBT people and on the, um, on the, on the pretense that they are enforcing the social distancing guidelines. We've seen this happening uh, in my region. We've seen this happening in Uganda. We've seen this happening in Zambia and Tanzania. And most of, uh, from mo those countries that are criminalized, they still criminalize same-sex uh, uh, relationships uh, and gender identities. Um, um, LGBT peoples are not being able to leave their, their homes. And if they're not able to leave their homes, they cannot access the few, and I'll say this, very few um, services that are out there, that are out there for them. Uh, we, we, we have to, uh, to acknowledge that um, being an LGBT person in the global north and being an LGBT person in the global south is not the same. The safety nets are not there. So uh, I'm not saying that our brothers and sisters in the global south are not suffering from this pandemic, but I'm saying that the horrible things that we've been uh, receiving, uh, the horrible reports that have been receiving from across the continent, they are quite appalling. Uh, so you, you have countries uh, that have these structural barriers that prevent LGBTI people uh, from disclosing their sexual orientation and gender identity, and they're being abused, they're being violated. And they, these abuses and violations are being perpetrated by both private and state agencies, and even worse. For instance, only yesterday our Uganda cam comrades were able to free our, 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 um, the, our people from, 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 from jail because the, the Ugandan state has, as Victor has said previously, used the COVID-19 as, as, as a pretense to, to lock down um, LGBTI people who were seeking shelter. So can you imagine someone who doesn't have uh, a home uh, or, or, or cannot, doesn't have a family or the family has disowned them and they are in a shelter and then comes a state agent and lock them in a, in, in, in a prison. So um, this, is, this is appalling. So we have to understand that there are human rights violations also that are being underreported because some of the states have, have stated uh, state emergencies. And during the state emergency, uh, some of, of these human rights violations are not being, uh, uh, being able to be, to be tackled with. So um, the more, I think that the more insidious um, impact of this COVID in, 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 in our region is being the loss of li uh, livelihood. Gloria touched some of, the, of those aspects and I said that it, it, it's, it's a thing that it goes across the world. Um, uh, LGBT people with small businesses, they have been forced to close down. Leaving thousands of LGBTI people in small and medium um, businesses uh, to their luck. So uh, it's worth the remind that LGBT people uh, especially trans communities, and I'm glad uh, we have here someone that feels and, and understands how how, LGBT, how trans communities uh, are being affected from this from this pandemic. And uh, most of our communities, especially the poor ones, they are not coping well with this with this pandemic. Issues such as poverty, we have to address um, issues such as poverty. And one of the things that uh, I'd like also to mention is that although there are um, uh, some 
uh, initiatives out there in the world, some initiatives to, uh, to respond to this pandemic, the bureaucracy beyond that is, pre is preventing um, small organizations, grassroots organizations to respond adequately to this pandemic. We are talking about people that are not, they, they don't have uh, something to eat. Uh, this is, uh, I'm sitting here, I'm quite privileged to be sitting in my study and talking to you, but there are a lot of people out there that cannot afford a meal uh, this evening. So um, I would like to also to use this opportunity to our well wishes out there, the people and the organizations that are putting um, resources to respond to this pandemic, that we need to be expedited because we are talking about lives. All the NGO bureaucracy, okay, it's needed, but we have to be expedite. Another thing that is happening is that it's totally different if you are an activist from the global north and an activist from the global south. Everything these days has to go online. We are talking about countries that have problems to access internet. How are you going to continue our work through internet when we are struggling to access internet? Everything is going online. And um, to tell the truth, some of the initiatives that are out there, they're quite privileged. People will not access videos. People will not access webinars. People will not access what activists and some of activists are putting out there as a way to continue the work because accessing internet, it's problematic. For you to access internet, you have to have money to buy the data and to have to have the right devices to access what is putting out there. Another issue that it's, that it's affecting, especially the human rights uh, defenders, uh, uh, apart from, from this internet, is that we have to, sh to, to, to shift and to change our, 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 our work. Uh, because you, we, we are used to go out there and talk to our lawmakers. We are used to go out there to talk in our communities. How are we going to do that through internet? So most of the work is halted. It's not possible. Some, there are some very good initiatives out there, but they are quite limited. I'm speaking from a country that has problems in access to the internet. We just have like less than 4% of the population that has access to internet. So how are we going to keep continuing and doing our work out there that is to mobilize, synthesize, synthesize and educate people around sexual orientation and gender identity? I need to, I think that we need to address two main aspects. How are we going to continue to work and defend human rights in this COVID pandemic, pandemic and post COVID, COVID pandemic? And another thing is how are we going to address and reshape uh, the, the, the interventions that we have as human rights defenders in, able to, in order to be able to, uh, in, as Victor said, empower, include, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and enforce uh, accountability out there. So I'll stop here and I think that I would love to hear from other panelists and our participants as well. Thank you very much, Danilo. Our final speaker is Yamania Brown, Yamania Brown, and uh, we very much look forward to hearing her remarks. Yamania, you have the floor. Thank you for that, Lawrence. Um, good evening, everyone, or good morning, or from the future. I'm in Brisbane at the moment, so it's um, 2.30 a.m. in the morning. I, I want to preface my presentation by saying that some of the things I'll be mentioning uh, is a trigger warning. So it might be uncomfortable for you. So if you feel um, that I'm talking about things that remind you of your own pain and trauma, please just um, you know uh, drop out, and then you can come back later, OK? Um, <clears throat> Very briefly, uh, look, a selfie snapshot of COVID-19 and how it, how it affects LGBTI populations. For me, vi there's a violence to the visibility, right, for trans communities. You ask us to come out and be visible. We even have a trans day of visibility that we celebrate every year. But in 2018, did you know that Transgender Europe's Trans Murder Monitoring Project reported 369 trans killed, murdered around the world? 369. And you want me to come out and say, hi, I'm a trans of Afine from Samoa, go and represent the international organizations I represent, knowing 
that there is someone out there that will take me away from my children and end my life. Hashtag real talk. And maybe the best way that I can explain it to kick, to kick this off is unpacking the specific conundrum of community rights versus human rights. Human rights, from my perspective as a Samoan Matai, is a somewhat selfish approach. It is about me and my rights as opposed to my family, my community, my village's rights, right? In my Samoan community, my Ainga, my family, my parents couldn't care less about whether I want to wear a dress or act in the manner of a woman. All my family care about is, am I okay? Am I safe? And what am I bringing to the table for the betterment of my community? That's as basic as you get, right? Now, is this the right approach? It's one of many approaches. We have something to offer, um, and definitely there needs to be room made at the Human Rights Diaspora for other indigenous and traditional practices from the global south that support the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so we talk about social justice a lot, right? Um, and social justice for me is about inter intersectional approaches to ensure that there is equality for all, to ensure that there is access for all. And as you've heard from Danilo and Gloria, woefully inadequate in the global south. Right? And, 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 and we want to ensure that there is a world that is truly free and equal, as the UN has been campaigning for. It's about linking common struggles to find commonalities, to lend support, to weave voices, to make a stronger push for social justice. And not one sector can do it alone, not the LGBTI people. We cannot do it alone. We must, must, must band together in order to advance. And we are not, as has been said many times, we are not single issue people living single issue lives. So here's some examples um, for states that are pushing the boundaries of justice to further erode the limited human rights for LGBTI citizens during COVID-19. Danilo has spoken so eloquently about the Ugandan police. They raided an LGBTI homeless shelter in Kampala and arrested a number of residents for violating social distancing rules. Uh, you know, they were jailed for 50 days and recently, um, you know, uh, yeah, they're, they're about, they, they've been released. Belize police arrested and beat up an HIV positive man who later died for what? For violating a curfew. The Philippines police publicly humiliated three LGBTI people plus others, forcing them to dance and kiss each other in public and videoed. In Hungary, you know, they've recently introduced a bill to ban transgender people from legally changing their gender in their country. Morocco is going through campaigns of outing LGBTI citizens you know, resulting in their being ostracized by families, kicked out of homes with limited access to resources during the lockdown. These are devastating effects for stay at home restrictions, especially on LGBTI youth who are confined in hostile environments with unsupported family members and or roommates and the rise of the religious right adding condemnation for LGBTI people. And what do, what do like, I mean, what do these show? What do all of these, these, you know, this, this angst against LGBTI during COVID-19 show, that decriminalization is important, but it's only a beginning, a crucial mm. beginning because it opens doors. But I caution, there is a massive difference between the legal equality and the lived equality of LGBTI citizens. Massive, huge. So check out the Ilga World Research publication. I'll, I'll send the links over to the, the organizers and you can, you can see the, the state-sponsored homophobia report and also Ilga Europe recently released its Rainbow Europe report, which reviews human rights situation for LGBTI people in, in European countries. And if you need data for your research papers, the data is out there. Just, just get in touch with those organizations. The, 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 the second part that I wanted to talk about is the role that the UN can play in advancing action for support for LGBTI citizens during COVID-19. First of all, the UN experts issued a recent joint statement, awesome start. Thank you, Victor, for spearheading that campaign. And it is so heartwarming. And, and, and like most of us just cried when we saw that. It was like, this is a long time coming. So thank you. We also need to look at finding a way to enforce a legal obligation on members who do sign up to adhere to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and then fragrantly act against its articles and principles. Current, currently, it's not but it should be. And yes, you have your UPR processes and your independent experts, you know, and we, 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 we have our own SOGI independent expert. You have your UN treaty bodies and mechanisms, but why, why in 2020 are my people still dying? Because of who they love and, and how they self-identify and the way they were born, why? Our oppression is a continuous cycle of repression. 
and it's time for the UN and the Human Rights Council to grow up and flex its considerable diplomacy muscles and affect real change fast. Because we on the ground, you've heard from Gloria, you've heard from Danilo, we on the ground have had enough, enough pain, enough tears, enough death, enough violence and discrimination. Trans women being hunted in streets in Latin America and Europe, publicly flogged in Asian countries, killed everywhere. LGBTI populations forced into barbaric and inhumane conversion therapies, therapies. No, no, no. You know, the UN Declaration of Human Rights states that each one of those states must guarantee equal rights under their laws and freedom from discrimination for all individuals in the society. And that's my dream. That's your dream. That's our dream. But it's a freaking nightmare at the moment. Please. Right? The, the last part I wanted to talk about is resources. And you've heard from Danilo and, and Gloria and, and Victor, right? There needs to be more resources and funding. You cannot do anything. You cannot fight COVID-19 and limit resources, right? Flat, you, you, you're, you're talking about flattening the curve to infection. We've been fighting for decades to flatten the curve of discrimination and violence, right? And, and advancing social justice with little to no resources. I mean, Gloria and Danilo are examples of the resilience of LGBTI people doing so much with so little. The Global Philanthropy Project, right, links will be submitted to the, to the organizers. Their snapshot of funding for LGBTI issues in its 2016 reports, the GPP reported, foundation funding for LGBTI issues is 17 cents per $100 of funding. Imagine what we could do with $1 of every $100 of funding. Government funding in 2016 was four cents per $100 of LGBTI IQ funding. Imagine if we could do with 50 cents of every $100. There are phenomenal organizations out there, the Global Interfaith Network in, in, in South Africa, the International Trans Fund, the Intersex Fund, to name a few. We need more funding. Really, there is no excuse to not fund incredible work done by international LGBTI organizations around the world, especially in the global south, global south, so that activists such as Danilo and Gloria and myself and thousands more do not have to fight for social justice with both hands and feet tied, both eyes taped over in a darkened room. And that's my intervention. Thank you so much for the time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Imani, for the very detailed and really impassioned plea that you uh, have made to, to everyone. We have had a number of different interventions, questions from the audience, and uh, just remind you that please submit them via the uh, Q&A function on Zoom or via Twitter, uh, hashtag COVID-19 justice. Let me get started by combining two of the questions that we received. The two relate to both two aspects of some of the challenges of the pandemic for uh, the LGBTI community. So the first relates to fact finding. Given the, the challenges of accessing communities during the pandemic to find out information on the ground, uh, how, how is fact finding changing? How are we learning about the kinds of violations that are ongoing that Yamania and others mentioned? How uh, can we do more to find out what we don't know in this regard? So how has fact finding changed? What suggestions do you have for any of the panelists along those lines? And then combining that with the uh, assistance that researchers might be able to provide. So what uh, kind of uh, research and data needs would support the work of LGBTI civil society groups or other groups that are in collaboration with them to address these issues? So what kind of information would you want to have to further bolster and support the work that all of the panelists are, are doing? So maybe Victor, I'll invite you to, to say a few words at, at first about that if you, if you do and then if any of the other panelists, since there are only four of us, you probably just let me know that you'd like to make an intervention or just go ahead and, and make it. They're just the five of us, so please. Thank you, Lawrence. And uh, I'm sure that uh, there'll be a variety of opinions around the screen uh, with uh, the very, very experienced colleagues that we have. 
Let me start though by expressing my uh, admiration for Imania because I did not quite realize that it's 2.30 in the morning in Brisbane and I am just absolutely flabbergasted that she's still looking as fresh as she is. I know it's also late for Danilo, but uh, Imania I think takes the record. Um, so fact finding and evidence. I uh, had the possibility to work on this on the report that I presented to the Human Rights Council last year on the whole issue of data and evidence. Uh, allow me to share with you three main findings, which undoubtedly are things, each of which would be a symposium in itself. The first one is that there is a phenomenon of negation uh, in very many countries and contexts around the world. It is very often, a lot more often than one would, what one would suppose, where uh, political leaders and mid-level uh, bureaucrats around the world are working very actively to erase LGBT existences out of the picture. And this goes from the very, very high political dialogue where the message would be, uh, for example, what the Minister of Justice of Russia said publicly on the record at the UPR, he said, We've looked for the gays and we cannot find them. This was a literal expression. Uh, that's a political statement of negation of the existence of LGTB persons. Uh, and then you have negation all throughout, uh, including, for example, mid-level bureaucrats that refuse to include questions relating to these issues in data gathering exercises, such as the census, for example. And we've seen that happening uh, all over the world. Um, I think the other, the other thing that I need to uh, mention in relation to this is there where the existence of LGTB persons is accepted, stigma has penetrated very deeply into the structures and that tendency to constantly question the need, for example, to obtain disaggregated data is something that all uh, organizations and activists and LGTB persons are fighting against. So what is, what is the alternative that is being implemented in very many countries? And I'll give you the example of Latin America where data is being gathered by civil society. But of course it's being gathered with the limitation that civil society works within. Inmania has made a very clear case in relation to that. What does that mean? Well, data is gathered with uh, limitations in terms of geography, where the, there that the, where the NGO works, data is gathered. There where it doesn't work, of course, it, ca it cannot be. And then it depends on flows of funding that sometimes just stop. And then it's very difficult to obtain data that will continue in time um, in a way that is meaningful. Finally, uh, criminalization is a terrible uh, obstacle for data gathering because how do you ask people about their uh, lives when there is such a strong state-sponsored statement about their lives being considered not only um, disordered in some way, but actually antisocial. And I think that this is uh, obviously a big, big hindrance. The last trend that I will mention in relation to this is that there are very significant asymmetries in relation to the evidence that is gathered in the global north and the evidence that is gathered in the global south. Allow me to give you a very specific example. I just completed a report on conversion therapy. Um, I, it will be coming out uh, very soon, within the next few days. And for that report, I carried out a literature review and I will uh, pretty much communicate that 98% of the literature it concentrated on the global north and was produced in English, with notable exceptions in Latin America where some uh, literature has been produced in Spanish and so on and so forth. In other regions of the world, you just had a huge vacuum of information. And what this means is that the studies in which public policies get founded are therefore then produced within understandings of dynamics that are global north specific which means that very, very often they fall off the mark in relation to the real dynamics of communities, peoples, and populations in the global south. So all of these are dynamics that we need to study and make sure that we um, work within them. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Victor. Do any of our, we have quite a growing queue of, of questions. Do any of our uh, other panelists want to address either the fact-finding point or the type of uh, research and data needs uh, that would support uh, the, your work? Very quickly, just very quickly. Um, one, when we talk about capacity building for NGOs in Global South, there needs to be an element of research base, you know, for that. Because all we're doing is we're, we're building organizational capacity, but we're not building the research capacity. We need our own people to do our own research. We are tired of people coming from the global north and poking at our lives and pulling it apart. Then they get all that data, they write their feces, they get their letters, and they fly away. And we're sitting there with nothing, right? So we're tired of that. Like, come on, if you need to enable us, build our capacity for research. When we write research proposals, you say, oh, but it doesn't fit in with, with our aims and objectives. Come on now, come on now. You know, there are capable people, black and people of color who can do their own research. Engage them, pay them what they're worth. That's so important. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Uh, I, just, I just want to build on that. I just wanted to build on that. And thank you, Emmanuel, for touching that about extractive uh, research that the Global South uh, has suffered for a long time, which we've been fighting uh, also for a long time. I think that um, evidence gathering is key to our interventions. Uh, if we don't get evidence, we will not be able to shift policies. And, and if we don't uh, get evidence uh, from the right people, with the right people involved, we also be doing more damaging uh, more harm than good. And uh, I totally agree with you, uh, and I totally agree with Victor. Uh, we need to support evidence gathering in the Global South, done by Global South people who, who understand the context that they're operating in. But I also want to touch another thing, which uh, as we're talking about social justice, and one of my, interve my, one of my intervention was about uh, the differences between being an activist in the, in the global north and being an activist in the global south. Uh, I don't want people to confuse or misquote me on that. It, um, what I'm saying is that in the global south, you don't have the same safety nets that you have in the global, in the global north. The states and, and the state institutions are not as stronger as they are in the global north. They will not come to you if you are in the global south they are this, some of them, this, this, this institution are dysfunction, and you don't have the protective um, entities and measures that will enable you to continually, continuously do your work as a human rights defender. So I think it's quite important that we touch this, this, these things. Uh, how are we going to move forward? And this COVID-19 has exposed so many differences has exposed how so many inequalities in this world, even in our sector. So I think it's a good opportunity that we are having this discussion. Thank you, Danilo. Uh, and thank you, Yamania. The, the second set of questions I'd like to raise here go to the question of uh, building alliances among different groups. Yumani, you mentioned the common struggles and finding commonality is very important for achieving social justice. We can't do it alone. Uh, and also the way in which there are commonalities about communities that are uh, in need, whether it is a loss of livelihood to small businesses, uh, or inequality, or poverty, or lack of internet access. And so I, I'm wondering, uh, and maybe I'll just initially, it's again to all the panelists, but uh, maybe I'll first, Gloria, ask uh, either of you, are, are you seeing any uh, connections uh, among different uh, advocacy movements or civil society groups in Latin America? So one question, that I have been wondering myself is whether uh, some of the evangelical movements, the, the church-based movements uh, that are concerned with uh, poverty and uh, the well-being of, of humanity, whether there's some way to make common cause there or whether that's simply uh, outside the scope 
given the kind of uh, push for uh, gender, the gender ideology movement uh, that they have been pushing uh, recently. So Gloria, maybe you could address the question of alliances and, uh, and intersectional uh, uh, connections among civil society and what you've seen that, that might be positive uh, if you have some examples going forward, please. Well, well, I think that uh, most of the, I mean, the traditional linkages that we have built on in, in Latin America has been the feminist movement with the LGBT movement. We have been working together for many, many years in different ways. It depends on the countries, but most of the region are very much linked. In, in the last uh, years, maybe in the last 10 years, we have uh, broader, we have a broader, broader linkages with the indigenous and with the Afro-descendant movement. So we have built on this uh, big umbrella in which we have very interesting discussions, even with the se sexual workers, with the network of sexual workers. And I think that it has been very enriching, not only for the for for the work that we the advocacy work that we're doing, but for the, a new way of, of thinking in in each one of the of the movements, but uh, as as I as I see in the in the last twenty years maybe the the evan evangelicals has been a very big obstacles for our for our rights, especially in well in in Uganda. Danilo can say about it, but. Uh, but the, in Latin America, the increase, in not only in Latin America, I think that this is a global situation. The increase of the right wing uh, and conservative governments have, be, have made very strong linkages with these religious groups. And it has been a, a, a real threat for our rights. And I think that uh, this is something that uh, we have been working on from the Sexuality Policy Watch about trying to find out what is happening in each country in Latin America and how these groups are really fighting against the advancement of our rights. I think that there's, this is a specific issue that we have been working with and, and there's a big network in, in, in Latin America that are watching on what's happening on it. Uh, any other uh, members of the panelists care to comment on this? We might have time for one yeah. more question. I, I want to I, I want to um, add to what Gloria said that there's a there's a two two ways to look at this. There needs to be a, dec a, a an actual truthful decolonization from global north organizations, right? And um, when they look when they're dealing with global south. They need to truly decolonize their thinking processes, their organizational process, so that you know we, we can actually sit down in a table and have a fruitful discussion. The second part is the challenge to the LGBTI movement itself. We need to be united, and I say united in, in, in this fight. We cannot fight this alone. The trans community cannot do this alone. The gays cannot do this alone. The lesbians cannot do this alone. We are together. We need to present a united front to be able to do this. And it's really important because I know as a trans woman, everywhere I walk in and there are turfs, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I turn around and because I, I know that I'm going to be shamed and kicked out or you know, thrown out. So it, for me, un unity is absolutely important. And, and the decolonization work that's continuing now needs to continue. So it's more meaningful. Thank you. We're nearly out of time, um, but I wanted to raise one other question that I think might be relevant to uh, the kinds of cross-border issues that uh, we're thinking about. So in terms of questions of uh, individual uh, security and safety and so forth, one of the ways in which, particularly if, as Damila was saying, one's home life is uh, adversely affected by the pandemic uh, as an out uh, uh, person or um, the way different ways in which we've heard some countries have done much better on these issues perhaps uh, than others. I'm wondering if any member of, of the panel has uh, seen any 
change in the way restrictions at the national level on the processing of asylum claims for uh, LGBTI persons has been uh, has been occurring. Is that something I, I don't know, Victor, that I saw that in in the statement. I only looked at it very quickly. But I wondered whether that is something that is is worth really focusing on. And also, Yamania, from from your perspective in particular, I know those issues have been quite important in different parts of, of the world. So I'll, as to any member of the panel, maybe Victor, again, do you want to, to start? And then we can do this will be our last question. Actually, Lawrence, if that's all right, I see that Imania uh, uh, had... Uh, of course. No, I, 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 I said that it was... It was covered in the statement, you know, the issue of asylum. I was covered so, in the statement. Okay, it was, and 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 and, and I you. wanted Victor to maybe just elaborate a little bit on that. That was that was what I was going to say. Well, thank you very much. I I very much appreciate it. Um, uh, it is touched upon, but I think at the moment what we know is that this follows the trend of more of a general. Um, trend that we are seeing, and with uh, my colleague, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Migrants, we are very concerned about, which is basically the use, again, of COVID-19 um, as um, uh, a measure that will, at some point, go beyond the protection of public health exclusively and actually mm -hmm. go on to the enforcement of other purposes within uh, migration policy, which I believe is a real threat and where, uh, as we know, uh, it's a generality of the person on the move, persons on the move that will be affected. But as we know, within that population, there are certain uh, peoples, uh, persons, communities that will be impacted uh, in a disproportionate way. Um, the I think we may have... Uh... To what extent are we addressing uh, this? And we will continue uh, taking a look at that. But to me, the key, Lawrence, will be the constant assessment as to whether the measure continues to be reasonably grounded on the protection of public health, or it has become a proxy for enforcement of migration policies that otherwise have not been achieved. Thank you. Well, we are um, unfortunately out of time, and I will certainly uh, pass along the questions that uh, uh, you've received. I'll pass them along to, uh, to the panelists. I think we've had a number of very important uh, and enlightening perspectives on a variety of issues. And I think if there were one overarching idea that uh, the panelists' interventions might leave you with, is that we have two different kinds of, of, of challenges, at least many more. But one are the, the types of measures that target uh, LGBT individuals uh, in, in Uganda, in, uh, in Hungary, uh, in Belize, in the Philippines, as we heard about. And the other is questions of disparate impact of individuals where the policy itself on its face is not intended to uh, at least overtly uh, restrict the rights of LGBT persons, but in fact, in practice, has uh, greater harm to one or more members of those uh, communities. And I think both of those are going to be equally important in thinking through questions of fact-finding and data gathering, in thinking through the different strategies for advocacy, both within the communities uh, and across with broader alliances. And so obviously this is a conversation that is going to continue. Uh, and I urge uh, all of you who are interested in it to continue to follow uh, the work of all of our panelists and their activities uh, in the future. So please, uh, I know you'll join me in thanking uh, all of the panelists for, for taking the time and for their uh, insights and thoughts. And just to remind you uh, that a recording and closed captioning of this event will be available on the, the uh, website of the series, uh, which is uh, tinyurl slash COVID justice series. So 
Uh, I wish all of you uh, the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Danilo. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks, Victor. Thanks, Victor. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks, Lauren. Great to see you all.